Hi, I'm Jonathan Lafarge, engineer, sound engineer, and founder of the Dudo Studio, your artist residency, recording, and rehearsal studio nearby Paris, France. In this video, I will explain what an in-ear monitor system is and what it's used for. Then I will show you how I built our IEM rack in three steps. Planning based on requirements, equipment and cost, usage and adoption. And finally, at the end of the video, I will share my opinion on this system after using it for a few months. You can navigate through the video using the chapter links in the video description below. With my band The Dudo, check us out by clicking here. We have been playing concerts in bars, stages, festivals, as well as for companies and private events for 17 years, using traditional stage monitors or wedges. We decided to switch to IEMs after a particularly loud concert in December 2022. On stage, it was becoming increasingly challenging to hear ourselves and the monitor speakers were getting louder. I experienced tinnitus ringing in the ears for two weeks after that. It convinced us that we needed to switch to IEMs. Since I am the most tech-savvy member of the band, I took on the task. Well, let's be honest, I also enjoy doing it. I would like to share my analysis, experiments and tips with you so that you can also make the switch or improve your system. What is an IEM system and why do we need it? IEM, or in-ear monitoring, allows each musician to hear their own monitor mix directly in their personal earphones, rather than through traditional floor or wedge monitors. Numerous advantages include drastically reducing the acoustic pressure on stage, which relieves fatigue reduces the risk of tinnitus and improves sound clarity in the venue. Each musician can independently control their own monitor mix using their smartphone and clearly hear the entire band according to their preferences without relying on the sound engineer. No more, please up, please down. Eliminating the risk of feedback compared to traditional floor monitors. It will also simplify the work of the sound engineer who no longer needs to manage individual monitor mixes and can focus on the front of the house sound. It will save time during sound checks once the settings are done. It allows for a virtual sound check to adjust the mix calmly at home. It reduces the amount of equipments to transport, eliminating wedge monitors, for instance. It facilitates self-sounding system for live gigs. It also helps for multi-track recording. There are some disadvantages, though. First, it requires a significant investment of several thousands of euros. Hours cost around five grands. It can be a bit heavy. Hours weight 50 kilograms, so 110 pounds. It requires a band member with technical expertise and dedication who will spend time setting up and mastering the rack. There are already numerous videos available on YouTube about IEMs, and I encourage you to watch them. It's always good to learn from others' experiences and see different configurations and equipment. The composition of an IEM system. First, a mixing console, transmitters for wireless IEMs, receivers, earphones. Ideally, these earphones should provide a high level of sound isolation, isolating the musician from ambient noise, protecting their ears from loud sounds, for instance, drums, and improving bass. Let's move on to the second major point building an IEM rack in three steps. Step one, planning based on requirements. This step is essential for two reasons. First, determine the necessary equipment and optimize the budget. Second, minimize the size of the rack by optimizing the arrangement of components, front, rear, etc. Practically, if you were good at Tetris on your old Game Boy, it will come in handy. So let's talk about our requirements for the Dudo. We're nine musicians. We need 24 input channels plus the click track. So for drums, eight channels, kick, snare, hi-hat, tom high, tom medium, tom floor, and two overhead for stereo. Bass, stereo also because he has a pedal of effects. Guitar, stereo also. Keyboard, stereo. Tenor sax plus vocals because he's also 
chorist, baritone sax, trumpet plus vocals, flute plus vocals, lead vocals, plus stereo room microphones. We are going to talk about that. And the click track. Only the three musicians at the front of the stage need wireless IEMs. The others can use wired ones, which are cheaper and simpler. We also need to keep two outputs for the front of house if we are managing the front house ourselves. So my recommendation is to create a drawing of your system using, for instance, Google Slides. You can collect pictures of the different components from Google Images or Thumbn, as well as an inventory of all the gear on Google Sheet with the budget. You can also prepare a patch sheet on Google Sheet as well. This information will also be useful to update the band's technical sheet. Ours is made on Figma. After planning comes the second step, equipment. Please note, we're going to talk about gear. I will provide the references for the gear I chose for our rack and I explain why I selected them. I will include all the references link into the video description below. First, we need a rack. I took a 10 unit rack with wheels for mobility, considering the way the wheels are essential. So I chose the Flight Pro Rack 10U from Thoman for about 200 euros. Some reviews said it's not sturdy enough, but since we don't go on international tours, it's been reliable for the dozen gigs we play each year. We received the rack with rails on only one side, so I purchased additional thumb rails for 22 euros a pair from Thoman. These extra rails allows me to install components also on the rear side of the rack. By the way, the thorn rails are much better than the default one in the Thorman rack, thanks to a rubber gasket at the bottom that keeps the nuts in place instead of falling off the rail. Installing them requires a rivet plier, although <laughs> if I were to do it again, I would simply use screws, like on the front rail provided by Thorman. So now let's talk about the Brain, a digital mixing console. This is the device that manages the sound, mixes, effects, and recording. I chose the Behringer X32 rack from Thorman. We bought it for 1,099 euros in June 2022. I chose it because the Dudo Studio is already equipped with its big sister, the Behringer X32, and I'm very satisfied with it. The Behringer X32 rack is a digital mixing console that occupies three rack units. It provides 16 XLR inputs with 48 volts phantom power, 8 XLR outputs, 6 auxiliary jack inputs, 6 auxiliary jack outputs, and a 48 volt phantom powered XLR talkback input. If you're smart enough, you can manage 23 input channels using only the aux inputs and the talkback inputs in addition to the standard 16 XLR inputs of the rack. Just activate the talkback permanently and send it into a mix bus. Then use that mix bus as an input for a channel. Let me know in comment if it's not clear, I will answer it. I initially did it that way, but in the end I preferred adding a Behringer S16 digital snake to provide 16 XLR inputs with phantom power plus 8 XLR outputs. It costs 633 euros on Thorman and takes up two racks units. Since the XLR connectors on the S16 are on the front, while they are on the back of the X32, I install them back to back with the X32 on the front face of the rack and the S16 on the rear face. This arrangement makes it easy to connect everything. The advantage of this time of digital mixing console is that we can easily manage multiple outputs, one in mono or even two in stereo for each musician. Each musician can then control their own monitor mix using these outputs. And the best part is that everyone can do it from their smartphone using the MXQ app. Let's talk about the splitter now, to direct the signals. The splitter is used to send each channel to the front of house mixing console. It also allows for direct connection of all the microphones at the front of the rack, eliminating the need to access them from the back. Essentially, we create a duplicate of each line coming from the stage. One copy of the signal goes to our X32 console and the other copy goes to the front of house console. For this purpose, I chose three Behringer Ultralink MS8000 splitters from Thoman costing 98 euros each, providing a total of 24 channels, three sets of eight. On the front panel, there are eight female XLR connectors for inputting the microphones. And on the rear panel, 
there are two male XLR connectors for outputting the duplicated signals. You simply connect one of the outputs to an input of the X32 or S16 using XLR XLR patch cables, and the other output goes to a standard snake. This snake is then connected to the multicore cable on stage, which goes to the front of house mixing console or directly to the front of house console if it's nearby. Be sure to label each cable of the snake for easy identification. Next, the Wi-Fi. You need a quality router. To allow each musician to connect to the mixing console using their smartphones, you need a reliable router. Don't settle for a cheap 30 euro router lying around in your drawer. They often have poor performance. I made that mistake with a small Netgear router, but it wasn't powerful enough on large stages for musicians to connect without interruption. Instead, I recommend the Swissoning Professional Router 2 MK2, priced at 190 euros, which occupies one rack unit and provides both 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz networks. It works perfectly, and I suggest hiding the network to prevent random people in the audience from connecting during the concert and messing up with your settings. For wireless microphone receivers, in our case, only the tenor saxophonist, myself, has a Shure BLX14R B98Q25 wireless microphone receiver, which was purchased for 548 euros in 2017 and has been working great. However, our trumpet player wants to have one as well. Luckily, we have space in the rack to accommodate a second receiver, as you can see. Wireless IEM transmitters. We chose two different types of transmitters. First, Sennheiser XSW stereo transmitters for myself and the trumpet player using radio waves. We purchased two refurb units from Thoman in March 2023 for 515 euros and 555 euros. One is band A and the other is band E to avoid any interferences. Second, a mono Wi-Fi transmitter, the X Vive U4 for the lead vocalist, purchased for 221 euros on Amazon. This is pretty cheap and super good quality, super small, really easy to hide somewhere and quality is really good. I really recommend if mono is okay for you. Wired IEM boxes. We opted for the Behringer PowerPlay P2 wired IEM boxes because they are affordable, 58 euros at Thoman, practical and provide stereo sound. However, you will need to purchase AAA batteries for them. I recommend using high quality batteries, such as Duracell, and regularly checking their power levels. Earphones. Using your regular earphones is not suitable for IEMs. We tried it during rehearsals, but there were always issues. For the band members, we chose Mi Audio M6 Pro earphones, which were recommended in a YouTube video on IEMs I've watched. They are affordable, of good quality, and can be upgraded for $150 with custom molded earpieces. We purchased them directly from the manufacturer in the US, and with custom duties, they cost us only 35 euros each. I recommend using the black memory foam ear tips provided with the earphones for better sound isolation. For enthusiasts like myself, I invested in custom fit Earsonics IEMs for 1200 euros. It's a significant investment, but the comfort and quality take to another level. They provide complete isolation, are very comfortable, have excellent bass response and deliver perfect sound. And plus, they look cool. If you're interested, the process is straightforward. First, you make an appointment at any company like Audica to get an impression of your ear. Audica does this for free, which is great. Two, you receive your magnificent ear impressions and send them to Earsonics by mail. Three, you place your order on the Earsonics website and you will receive your custom fit earphones two weeks later. On the rack, you will need also a power rack. It's an eight outlet power strip. So to power all the components in the rack, it's easiest to have an integrated power strip. I chose the Thumman Power APC, which provides eight electrical outlets on one rack unit. Simply connect a power cable to the rear of the power strip and the entire rack will be powered. And since there was some extra space, 
we added a two-unit half drawer to store MISC accessories. I chose the Thonrack drawer 2U short for 44 euros at Thoman. The drawer is very sturdy, very heavy also. To install it, I had to use an angled Shuko cable to power the S16, which is just behind the drawer. You also need a lot of cables and accessories. We've purchased various cables from Thoman and Amazon. You need XLR male to XLR female patch cables, so not too long. I took also 10 meter XLR male to XLR female cables, and I took it in black for inputs and in blue for outputs. You need a dual XLR male to jack male cable for the keyboard. You need XLR male to jack female adapters for the bass. It's really cheap and really convenient, you need that. You need also a Y cable with two XLR female to one XLR male for stereo wired EIMs. And to connect the click, because our drummer is using his phone uh, to get a click, I connect the phone with a USB-C male to mini jack female. I recommend the Apple one, even if it's really expensive, because just it works every time. And then you connect on it a mini jack male to XLR male, so that you can plug it into the rack. You need Ethernet cables to connect the rack to the router, but as well the S16 to the X32. You need also snakes for the rear of the rack. We took the SS Snake SXX8050 at 29 euros each at Thurman. We also purchased the flight case to store all these cables. I chose the Flight Pro WP Safebox 8 IP65 for 175 euros at Thurman. It's robust and rolls like a trolley. I do think it could benefit from a side handle for easier carrying, but overall it's a great case. Velcro cable ties. I tried several options. The scotch roll of hook and loop fasteners, twist wires, and the thumb and hook and loop ties with a metal loop. Honestly, the simplest option is the pack of 100 unit for 8 euros on Amazon, which stays attached to its cable. You might need also a UPS, uninterruptible power supply. A friend of mine, sound engineer, recommended it. Thanks, Denis. Often, we plug into electrical outlets in random places, like a garden or a terrace that has weathered decays of elements. The risk is that, at best, the rack shuts down in case of a brief power outage, and therefore the IEMs, and the entire PA system if it powers the stage. And at worst, the electronics get fried due to a power surge. So, a UPS with a battery will protect against both of these risks without breaking the bank. We went with the Eaton Ellipse Pro 650 FR UPS, 155 euros on Amazon. You need also aluminum ramps. Our rack weighs nearly 50 kilos, so yes, I will avoid hurting my back. Two foldable aluminum ramps for 70 euros the pair on Amazon allow me to load and unload the rack by myself in my car. You will need batteries and battery tester. That's a lot of batteries. Another friend of mine, sound engineer also, hello Gérard, advised against rechargeable batteries. They are much less reliable and durable than high quality disposable batteries. So go for Duracell, don't be cheap. At least your gear won't die on you during a gig. A small battery tester will allow you to check the batteries before each concert and discard the weakest ones. To label everything neatly, a Dymo label maker, because no, we're not going to write with a marker on a piece of tape. Why? Just no. I didn't spend five grand on a top-notch gear to have ugly labels visible to everyone. I suggest also you to buy colored gaffer tape, easily recognizable to mark all the gear. It's a great idea from a friend of mine, a DJ. Hello, Guillaume. It will be very useful to avoid forgetting or accidentally exchanging equipment with the next DJ or band taking over. So we got a fluorescent pink gaffer tape for 4.90 euros at Thurman. Use in adoption. Not everyone adopts IEMs at the same pace. The sensation is different. Some feel closed off with a dry sound, like in the studio, losing the live feeling and the connection with the audience. It's challenging for a singer to get used to their own voice through earphones. So here are some tips to facilitate adoption. First, take your time. 
have several IEM rehearsal sessions so that musicians can get used to them, adjust their settings and benefit from your support. Yes, it's a bit of a hassle to transport all the gear to a rehearsals, but it's essential to adapt to this new way of playing, which is very different. Take also into account the occlusion effect. You can see Drew Brashler's video here. I'll give you the link. And adjust the EQ accordingly to improve the singer's experience. In a nutshell, when your ears are blocked like this, your sound sounds like this. Go ahead, try it. So the idea is to send an equalized sound of the singer's voice to the singer's mix to compensate for this occlusion effect and give them a more natural sound. Your singers and choristers will thank you. Another thing, you can switch to stereo IEMs to pan the musicians and create more space. It's not complicated. The MXQ app allows you to do it channel by channel or track by track. And the Behringer PowerPlay P2 wired units are stereo already. You just need a small Y cable, 2XLR females to 1XLR male, and you're good to go. It's much more enjoyable to reposition the musicians in stereo as they are on the stage. Another thing is to install ambient microphones to feel more in the room. Plus, they come in handy for mixing recorded tracks. For instance, let's have an example in our last gig at the Hangar Y in Meudon. We bought the small Behringer C2 condenser microphones, 55 euros per pair at Thummen. They're perfect. Another thing you can do to help the musicians to adopt your IEM system is to add reverb in the IEMs. The sound will be less dry and more spatial. I invite you to watch Drew Brashler's highly informative video on this topic. I provide a link above. You can offer a mixed mode with wedges for some and IEMs for others. For instance, our guitarist preferred to stick with wedges for this gig at Hangar Y. Of course, there's a bit of bleed and there's a risk of feedback, but it wasn't a problem at the, our last gig. Another point is save the control settings. It's super frustrating for a musician to have to readjust all the settings because you or the tech guy has played with the settings at home, changing and switching the tracks, etc. I'm sorry, Alain, I will not do that anymore. This can be done in the scene tab of the console. Another thing is to plan a virtual sound check after a rehearsal or a gig. The idea is to replay the recorded tracks through the rack as if you were live. You then have all the time to adjust your IEM mix from home later on. I recommend another video from Drew Brashler explaining how to do a virtual sound check with the X32. Look at the link, super, super cool video. Allow enough time for setup on stage. I recommend three hours before. So here we have several configurations. First, if the band is doing their own stage sound, it's ideal to have a sound engineer managing the front of house mix. Otherwise, one of the musicians will be juggling both. And I did it, honestly, it's not funny. If you need to install the rack on an existing stage and derive the stage patch into the rack, I recommend to contact the venue sound engineer beforehand to explain how our rack works. Usually, once they understand it, they're delighted because they realize it will make their job easier. No feedback, no monitors to manage. I recommend also using cable labels to identify each stage cable and facilitate repatching after the concert, especially if there are other bands playing on the same stage afterwards. So I bought these cable labels for 11 euros on Amazon. I will provide the link in the description. Another thing to reduce the risk of dropouts on the wireless systems. For Wi-Fi X5, I recommend to connect the transmitter at the end of an XLR XLR cable at the musician's feet instead of plugging it into the rack which is too far away from the singer. For radio EIMs like Sennheiser XSW, follow Drew Brashler's advice in this video and cut off everything above 15 kHz. Because first, these systems do not send sound above 15 kHz. And second, there is a control signal at 19 kHz. And if your sound includes 19 kHz, it could interfere. My opinion after a few months, the playing comfort is immeasurable. We can hear each other very well, hear all the musicians as we want, and we don't have a head like a watermelon after the concert due to excessively loud stage monitors. 
the lead singer, initially hesitant, can get rid of it now. She sings much more accurately now. Another thing is that the live recording capabilities are multiplied, and as a result, we have rather high-quality audio recordings of our gigs that helps to create material for social networks, etc. It requires less sound reinforcement equipment to transport, and it clears up space on the stage since there are no more floor monitors. Once the investment is made, there are virtually no additional expenses, except for batteries, and we are completely self-sufficient for sound reinforcement. So there you go. I finished this video. I invite you to subscribe to the Dudio Studio channel. I regularly upload recordings with professional musicians in my studio. Not too often, so you won't be overwhelmed. Click the bell icon to receive notifications of new releases. And feel free to leave your comment and any question. I'll be happy to respond. See you soon. Bye.